Hello, I'm Susan Flory. This is The Big Middle, this time taking a long, hard look at the problem with seed oils. It's another piece, another vital piece in the healthy longevity jigsaw. My guest is Tucker Goodrich, a leading authority on this subject and with a patient heal thyself story that I guarantee you is going to blow your mind. Tucker Goodrich, how are you? Very good this morning. Thank you for having me on, Susan. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm meeting you via the beauty of Zoom. You're in Idaho, northwestern state, the potato state. Boise, Idaho, where the McDonald's french fry was invented. Seriously? Who knew? It's pertinent to our topic of discussion as well, because those french fries used to be, from what I understand, fried in beef tallow, and then, mm -hmm. then the industry, what are they fried in now? Problematic seed oils. Seed oils, yes, almost exclusively. That is a very interesting story of what's been happening with frying fats. And it gets into the kind of the core problem with seed oils regarding human health. Okay, well, we'll because, set that yeah, aside it, it, for now. I want to reference the fact that I looked at your beautiful Instagram feed. Your side hustle is National Geographic Photography. <laughs> no, no, and that's not me just flanneling you. Anybody, what's your Instagram handle? Because they should go directly there and, and really marvel at some of the stuff you post. It's uh, Tucker Goodrich, I think. Honestly, I don't know because I don't really publicize it. But I, several years ago, decided that I was going to, to encourage myself to keep an eye on the natural world, that I would post something on Instagram every day. And I managed to do almost every day. Um, and it's mostly landscapes and close-ups of things that I encounter when I'm out running and mountain biking and skiing. You do barefoot running. I want to get all this off the top because once we get into the problem of seed oils, we're going to go deep. You do barefoot running. So right now you can't do that on the, the snowscapes of Idaho at the moment. Luckily, Boise doesn't get much snow. The mountains behind Boise, which are about 3,000 odd feet higher, get all the snow. So you know, if it's in the 50s, you can go out and you can run barefoot. Mostly I run in sandals or minimalist shoes. My, I mean, this morning it was about 23 degrees Fahrenheit. I went out running in a pair of shoes that most people would consider house slippers. And that's my typical winter running garb. That's how I got into this whole health thing was actually through this barefoot running movement that took off a number of years ago. And then I got introduced into the idea of how much of an impact a healthy diet can have on your health, which was quite quite an eye opener to me because at that point I was quite sick. <laughs> no, I know. We're going to get into that. But first, as our entree into that, our little doorway, you used to call yourself Mr. Wheat. Mr. I, Whole Wheat. Mr. Whole Wheat. And by the way, I was Mrs. Whole Wheat. Much, Both in retirement now. I mean, I was so much Mrs. Whole Wheat that when I was a university student, my my then boyfriend took to the supermarket, one of those huge supermarket carts, and because everything was whole wheat this, whole wheat that in the cupboards, he actually filled this massive cart with potato chips and Doritos, just loads and loads of rubbish food. And we fell about the aisle just laughing our faces off. <laughs> I have a few of those moments. Yeah, I, I, I had enough of a science background from when I was a kid. I was a bit of a science nerd. so. I never really got onto the low-fat bandwagon because I knew from our evolutionary heritage that that didn't make a lot of sense. But I did everything else. You know, I just assumed that somebody had done the research and if they're recommending, you know, a whole wheat instead of regular wheat, that that's the, probably the right thing to do. And I pretty much ate to the, the food pyramid. And the thing and is, just a small aside, you're not a PhD or an MD. You are a self-taught expert in seed oils, but for your day job, you were doing some, some pretty complicated maneuvers on Wall Street involving hedge funds and IT systems, and you still do that? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, as they say, in transition at the moment, but yes, I started as a stockbroker on Wall Street and then got into asset management and then into merger arbitrage, trading at a hedge fund in New York City had an amusingly average career as a trader. The average trader is a trader for only three years. So I was did a little better than average and that I wound up up when I left that line of work and the fund that I was working for, I was a trader and I was also their IT guru. And they asked me to spend my full time working on risk management and their IT systems. Um, 
And that, you know, originally was a part-time job for me. And then I wound up having a staff of about 20 people and helping them manage trillions of dollars in assets. Um, well, so you were so that, you were making these systems, building these systems, troubleshooting yes. problems, doing all that. So even before yes. you you were forced to focus on your own dysfunctional biology, you were a systems person. So you were used to taking a macro view and digging. Yes, and I was entirely self-taught in technology as well. So you, you did know. history and law, pre-law at university. Yeah, I did history and pre-law, and didn't actually wind up graduating from school. Went to Wall Street instead and got into the technology side of things just because I was given these tasks that basically required use of computers to solve. I didn't have a background in computer science or anything, but I could read a manual. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which is good because a lot of us hate those manuals. Yeah, read well, the flipping manual, Well, it's amazing how folks, far yeah. you can go on Wall Street just by reading the manual. Um, you know, one of my first tasks was figuring out the rate of return for the manager I was working for so that he could better market himself and then getting audited by uh, Deloitte, one of the big uh, American auditing firms. So I had no experience in computers, really no experience in accounting and I nevertheless managed to pass the audit and flying colors and help uh, turn my the little business that I was in around. So so when you read, it sticks. So I suppose everyone said, oh, wow, how does he know that? And you think, well, it's on page nine. Yeah, basically. I read a lot. You know, I mean, I hired a guy once to come to my office to install a piece of equipment and turns out he didn't really know what he was doing. And while he was futzing around with this thing, I just read the entire manual cover to cover and then said, OK, here, let's do this. Stand aside and finished installing the piece of equipment. OK, so, so let's have a cloning operation now just online yeah. here, Zoom to Zoom. I want some of those those gray cells you've got. Now, I want to zoom forward to 38 years old, what happened after some really rough times with your colon? Well, the colon came later. So, you know, I you was... You had 16 years before you got sick, is what I read. Oh, yes. That's yeah, yeah. a good point. Yes. Okay. So I should start in... When I was in my 20s, I, my late 20s, I was at a friend's house out in Connecticut and I got quite ill and wound up, um, you know, he drove me back into New York where I was living and I spent probably four or five days in bed in my apartment, dreadfully ill, like 105 degree fever. Um, and lost about 10 pounds. I was unable to eat or really drink anything more than water. And, um, after that, I was never quite the same again, and it didn't occur to me until I was 40 what had happened, which was when it happened again. And I was this time taken to the uh, hospital, spent four days in the acute care ward with a diagnosis of acute diverticulitis, which means a perforated colon. And this is where the contents of your colon are leaking into yes, your body. Yes, the contents of your colon are leaking out into your abdominal cavity. And suffice it to say, it's unbelievably painful and can be can kill you. I mean, that's how you get sepsis. Yeah. Um, I was lucky that I had a very good surgeon who had been reading up on gut shot treatments from the Iraq war and was able to treat me in such a way that I didn't need to have an emergency surgery to have a colon resection. Although unfortunately, I wound up having to have that about six months later. So yeah, I had been sick for quite a while. I mean, I had various bleeding incidents, including that time when I was in my 20s. And then later on, I would get bleeding in the stomach lining. Um, and I got hospitalized a couple of times because of that. Um, so you had gastric and intestinal issues for a number of years before, yes. even before the diver, I can't say that, the diverticulitis. diverticulitis. Yes. 38. Let's go to 38. Because well, th so wow, 38 was something Completely. related, but at the time seemed to be something different entirely. Um, I'm a big skier and I was in a ski, staying in a ski condo up in Vermont over the weekend. And I came back to work on Monday morning, got up, got out of the shower and I couldn't quite see right. And I didn't really know what was going on, but you know, I had to get to work. So I didn't really worry about it and got in the car, driving down the highway. And all of a sudden this car just like pops into place right in front of me. And I realized that he had been coming up an exit ramp 
and I hadn't been able to see him. My peripheral vision, about a third of my field of vision, had just disappeared. And I looked, turned my head and looked over, and there were all these other cars coming up this entrance ramp. And if I looked ahead, I couldn't see them. You know, it's like that blind spot test that they have oh you do word. when you're a little kid. How terrifying. So, except it was rather odd because I felt fine, you know, but again, I had to get to work. So I just looked around a little bit more and got to work, got onto a conference call and was partway through it and realized that I couldn't really talk. I was listening to what people were saying and I was understanding what they were saying, but I couldn't respond to it. So I managed to excuse myself from the call and walked over to my boss and managed to get out the words, I can't talk. Now, a fellow who worked for me was, had been an emergency medical technician. So he diagnosed me as having transient ischemic attack, basically a minor stroke. He knew that the, there was a stroke center um, not too far away from the office, but it wasn't where an ambulance would take me first. So he put me in his car and drove me to the stroke center where they also diagnosed me with a TIA. And I got to spend the next four days in this medical school being poked and prodded at by a professor and his little gaggle of students who were so excited to see me because as one of them said to me, you know, we never see anybody your age in here. Everybody that we see is old. And I was like, oh, this is just fabulous. This Animal really in a zoo. You I thought, oh, here I am. I'm fascinating all of these medical professionals. And Yeah, you don't so, want to be the guinea pig. No, you don't want to be the object, a subject of fascination in a room like that. So four days of this and did it progress? Did it change? What well, that was the interesting thing. They did every test they could think of, and they all came back negative. There was no evidence of a stroke. The professor was fabulous, and he wound up sitting with me in his office one day for several hours going through what my condition was supposed to look like and how it didn't look like that, and he couldn't really explain what was wrong with me. What was really interesting is that my ex-wife had three weeks previously also been checked into a stroke ward. So whatever was happening was something that was clearly common to the two of us and environmental. Yeah. Um, so his final diagnosis was, again, what you really don't want to hear from a medical professional. He said, wow, that's really weird. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Doc. Yeah. Thanks, and so Doc. did he commit himself to do the digging or did you just troubleshooter that you are hit well, the books was... and start scraping PubMed and trying to get to grips with everything? I did the digging. I mean, he was doing digging also. I thought he was, you know, he was excellent, but I finally got him to change his diagnosis from a TIA to a migraine because I started having migraine symptoms and I called him up and told him that. And it's very dif difficult to distinguish between a migraine and a stroke in some cases, which I didn't know up until that point. But and do migraines often cause you to lose your ability to speak? Yes. Really? And I was left with a speech impediment from this migraine, which he was able to diagnose. You know, there's a simple children's game that you play where you rhyme words by how they end, cat, hat, fat, sat, right, all that. Well, I couldn't do that after this incident. And it was something that I did all the time with my daughters. So it was quite clear that something had changed. And I'm lucky that it came back. How um, long did it take for it to come back? Uh, probably... A year or so. Um, a year. So you. But it was. It wasn't therapy. a sort of speech impediment where nobody noticed it but me. So I would just be at a loss for words momentarily sometimes. Um, and you know, as you observed, I now go blabbering along on these two-hour-plus podcasts. So I'm clearly recovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trust me, folks. I've listened to a few. He can talk. <laughs> but your story. I mean. The thing is, too, in one of the podcasts, I heard you talk about the guy, the doctor, who, who did some digging for you alongside you, was a professor of neurology at a teaching hospital. Yes, so he, he was said to me that I was... Your case and... he, he said to me that this was the only time he had ever changed his diagnosis because of research that was presented to him by one of his patients. Not having a diagnosis of a TIA is rather significant because it has, you know, health care health insurance, life insurance implications. Because once you have a stroke, your risk of having another stroke is like 7% a year. It's not good. So, you yes, know, that I was kind of- I forget that you're an American. You have to do all of those healthcare insurance calculations, which we don't right, have to do here right. in the UK. So, you know, it was nice to not 
have to say that I had been diagnosed with a stroke. Um, and that was, you know, there was no evidence that I ever had had a stroke. He just didn't have a better explanation until I was able to find a paper in the medical literature describing somebody in Germany who had a similar case and they, you know, ruled out that it was a stroke. So he said, okay, fine. I'm okay with that. So that's 38. I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm starting to get old. You know, this is old age. I figured this was just normal. Two years later, the colon thing reoccurred. And I realized that, you know, I had the same symptoms when I was in the hospital bleeding from the rectum as from when I was in my 20s and realized that this was a reoccurrence of something that had happened. And that's why I'd been had these intestinal problems for all of these years. I mean, which was bad enough so that I wound up having to travel most places with a backpack with a roll of toilet paper in it because I did, you know. From that first know. incidence in your 20s until diverticulitis was diagnosed in your 40s. Well, 40. Right. Well, and then after that too, because unfortunately they did a colon resection. I was told it was going to be curative and it was not. So the, that was kind of I just, annoying. Oh, unbelievable. And also too, I just want to lay in this other little bit of background that you had a history of autoimmunity, uh, autoimmune attacks. You had asthma, allergies, osteopenia, which is the forerunner of osteoporosis. So yeah. you were a very reactive guy. Yeah, as, as part of my research into what caused diverticulitis, the only thing that was negatively associated with diverticulitis um, incidents was running. This was before barefoot running. I just, you know, said, okay, well, maybe I can become a runner and not have to go through this uh, colon resection surgery. So it didn't work, sadly, but I did wind up loving running. So that was a good thing. The, um, where was I going with that point? Oh, well, yeah. The thing so is, I was I'm also... going to bring you back to it. So you did a lot of the digging and you came up with your own theories about why this cavalcade of issues happened to you progressively, yes. the deterioration well, that led to that final big D diagnosis. Right. Pro professionally, that's what I did. I, you know, they gave me problems and I figured out how to solve the problems. And this was to me just another problem. I mean, you know, what and was your starting point for understanding? Because, you know, you can scrape PubMed. I mean, thank goodness for the internet, the power of the internet, you really just want to embrace it and say superpower. Thank you. So you dug, dug, dug. But was there a moment where you went, Oh, my Lord, this is it. This is my problem. Well, that was, I had gotten, as you mentioned, into this barefoot running thing. And one of my friends in that field sent me a link one day to this PhD student blogger named Stephen Guillenet, who was also into barefoot running, but was also researching obesity and, and the neurological causes of obesity. So I started, you know, I mean, it was really dumb luck because when I first read the blog post about his barefoot running, I thought he was a kook. And then my friend sent me this other blog post where Stefan went through the science behind Weston Price's book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Weston Price was a dentist in the 20s and 30s uh, who was also a scientist. He was the head scientist of the American, what ultimately became the American Dental Association. And Stefan looked at the science since this book had been published and did it confirm what this fellow had said, which is still very controversial. And effectively, what he showed was that dental problems, specifically cavities and what they call dental malocclusion, you know, bad tooth placement, your face is too small for the number of teeth, was entirely the product of diet. Now, I have had so many cavities, I can't even remember how many, and I've had eight teeth pulled out. And the idea that this was effectively optional and was not caused by genetics as I had always been told because my mom had bad teeth and her mom had bad teeth. Stefan looked at these studies and Weston Price had looked at these studies where these populations of people went from perfect teeth to horrible teeth in a single generation. Wow. Right? That can't be genes. That and this, and you my... gave up sugar when you started to have all these cavities. This was what, in your 20s? Yes, I well, actually, my late teens, um, I actually listened to my dentist. He said, if you don't want to have more cavities, you should stop eating sugar. And I said, okay, I will. And I did. And I diligently for years and years and years, didn't eat sugar, read all the labels, bought only the, you know, no sugar added food products. And um, since in all those years, I've had one teeny little cavity after we got a 
candy jar at the office and I started eating mints. <laughs> wow. But it opened up my mind to the fact that, you know, okay, well, clearly in my case, diet had a big impact on all of this stuff. So, so I kept reading his blog and probably four or five months. And then one day I went down to the cafeteria at work and I was going through the, through the salad bar and I got to the end and there were all these squeezy bottles of salad dressing. That was one of the things that he talked about a lot. And I just looked at him and I said, you know what? I was like, those have got to be the cheapest oils that it's possible to put in a bottle. And they're just here in this lousy cafeteria, you know, so I'm going to stop eating them right now. And at that point, this was two years past my colon resection and I was still having the chronic diarrhea and, you know, still having to travel with a roll of toilet paper. And all of that stopped in two days. I still have the email that I, Stefan had been kind enough to talk to me and give me some advice. And I still have the email that I sent to him where I'm just absolutely blown away. I was like, I can't believe this. I feel better. It's been two days. This is un incredible after 16 years. So at that point I started saying, why is this happening? And you know, he didn't, he didn't know. He, he thought it was bad for you, but there was no explanation of why or how. So that was when I started guided in part by his suggestions, you know, I went through and I started reading stuff and reading all the papers that those things referenced. And, and you were also trying... Mr. Whole Wheat. So you back. Oh, away from yeah. That well, that was another well. interesting thing. Um, I had tried to go low carb, you know, because like, just to give a little context, I was kind of your typical 40 ish year old guy, I'd put on about a pound of weight a year since I was in my 20s. So I was, you know, about 20 pounds overweight at this point, still tried to exercise. I was running and everything and none of that. I never lost a single pound from exercise, which won't come as any surprise to most people who've tried to do that. So all the excess weight just fell off over the next two months. I lost 20 pounds. One morning I put my pants on, buckled up my belt buckle and let go and they fell to the floor. So I've never, I've never had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> I live for that day. I live for that um, day. And I've been keto for five years, but relaxed keto, 50 grams, all that. But for you, you had a gluten intolerance, not celiac, but a gluten yeah, so, intolerance as well as the reaction to the seed oils. Yes. Yeah, so what happened when I stopped eating seed oils is I lost my desire to eat carbohydrates. So I basically forgot to eat any carbs for a week. And then, you know, the following Friday, I went down to the cafeteria and I decided to have a roast beef sandwich on whole wheat bread because I'm Mr. Holy. <laughs> and I went up to my office and ate it and had this horrible reaction to it. And wheat had been another one of Stefan's bandwagons. And I said to myself, could it, could it be that I'm actually one of these people who's wheat intolerant? I was like, that can't be true. I eat wheat all the time and I'm healthy. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. So I did an experiment. I waited a week and then I had a couple of slices of pizza and I thought I was having a heart attack. I had to lie on the sofa in the office for an hour to recover. Wow. And, you know, subsequently to that, I've discovered that I can bring back the symptoms of the stroke like symptoms through wheat consumption. And it's happened a number of times where, you know, I've accidentally ingested something with wheat in it and I wind up unable to see and I can't talk and you know it's but yet luckily, it's not celiac disease you've had all of the standard tests and it's a, a high gluten intolerance it's not celiac disease i don't have the gene for celiac disease so that's you know all of a sudden there i am mr whole wheat can't eat wheat anymore i'm having a panic attack because i think i'm going to starve to death because i can't eat wheat and i mean i'd grown up with a mother who was always doing weight watchers and stuff like that and i thought all the diet stuff was nonsense and had no interest whatsoever in it. You know, I thought I ate a healthy diet and that was fine. And then here I am in the middle of my life realizing you're not going to make it, dude. You know, yeah. my parents and my grandparents all died in their 80s and 90s. And here I am halfway through life and I can really see the end of it coming up on me. So you gave you know, up the gluten and all of the seed oils and you started digging into the toxicity of seed oils. So let's right. let's get into some of that. What's the problem with them? And what, what are the oils we're talking about? We've got Savior olive oil over here, but everyone talks about the smoke point. And here in the UK, so many of the dietitians that I've had to unfollow are pushing the rapeseed because it's made in the UK. And it's yeah. like, you know, the canola oil from where you are. Right. So just a, a quick point, I'd heard the low carb 
folks say that sugar was the problem. And that didn't really work for me because I had already been eating low sugar for years and I still got sick and fat. So it clearly wasn't that. Um, and then I started thinking that it was wheat mainly. I mean, clearly the seed oils had had some effect, but I thought that most of my health problems were because of wheat. And I looked into that very extensively. And I mean, certainly for certain conditions, if you have an autoimmune disease, you should certainly be on a low, on a no gluten diet, but it doesn't seem to be the thing that's causing heart disease and the obesity epidemics. I just wasn't able to find the evidence to support that hypothesis. Um, if you are, you know, and I, as you mentioned, had a, hist a history of autoimmune disease. My daughter at that point, my father, myself, and my daughter was on track to get uh, anti-allergy shots. So, you know, it was clearly something that was in the family. And after I started doing the research about this, I said to her, she was terrified of shots. And I said to her, you know what, if you do this diet, I don't think you're going to need shots. I think your allergies are going to go away. It took two years, but in two years, her allergist fired her. He said, you don't have enough symptoms of allergies anymore to justify you needing the shots. So he was unwilling to consider the, you know, even though he was not aware of the autoimmune effects that are associated with wheat in the medical literature, he was not willing to take it into consideration that that was why she had changed so fast. Although he did concede that he had never in his practice seen somebody resolve their allergies as quickly as she had. Wow. So, yeah. So a light went on for him and whether it's still on, you just don't know. Probably. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But um, <laughs> Because so many people see it and they say, oh, that can't be right. And you think, well, mm, I'm the living proof. And, and I mean, at this, you know, at this point, I'm 10 years out from that and I have no allergies whatsoever. I mean, you know, I used to be super allergic to dust and now it doesn't bother me at all. The hay fever, allergies, everything's gone and it's been gone for years. So, <laughs> and you've been you've been no gluten, no wheat, none of this stuff that that you clearly react to, and the seed oils you've eliminated right. them. So let's get into so the, the, the why of the problem of the seed oils. How did you kind of hone in on that? And now you know that it causes not just you and your daughter and your ex-wife, but loads of people problems. Well, yeah, I kept doing. I mean, the thing that stuck with me was why why had I forgotten to eat carbohydrates? It was so strange. As I said, I tried to go low carb and I couldn't get over the carbohydrate cravings. And, you know, here I was doing it effortlessly. No hunger, no nothing, just weight falling off. People at work asking me, what are you doing? You look so much different. I started looking 15 to 20 years younger. I got carded by a gay bartender, which was probably the high point of that point. Because, you know, <laughs> that's not flattery. <laughs> I can just imagine you. Thinks, other people carding you and not believing how old you actually are. It's kind of a neat thing to go through. So you were um, Benjamin buttoning, really. I mean, it, yeah, it sounds um, like that's that was happening to you in the most amazing ways. But I had also had, as you mentioned, osteopenia. So I'd broke, I was into running and mountain biking and skiing. And over the course of two years, I'd broken six bones, ribs, nose, fingers. And the last one that really scared me was when I fell down when I was skiing and my, the tip of my thumb just snapped, Oof. right? Not a bad fall, just snapped. And I was like, okay, this is really strange. And I started researching into that. There are correlations with things like rheumatoid arthritis and wheat consumption, very high incidence of rheumatoid arthritis in people who were celiac, but I didn't really have arthritis symptoms. So as I kept looking, I started running into these discussions about some of the chemicals that it turns out are metabolic products of seed oils. There's specifically one called hydroxynonanol, the acronym's HNA that's generally used. And that's clearly an issue in osteoporosis and arthritis because it causes your collagen to break down and it causes fibrosis. So 10 years in now, it's kind of a joke because I still do all these stupid things and I have these epic falls and I just, I don't break bones. I don't even really, <laughs> Become you know, a rubber bruise. ball. Oh yeah. I'm like a rubber ball. Back. And it's, 
I don't have any pictures ready, but I mean, I could show you some pictures of some of my mountain biking accidents and literally digging up a furrow in the soil with my knee and it's fine. No injury. Trashing my skin, but yeah, it's like my healing capacity is up enormously. One of the, one of the other things that I noticed immediately, and we'll get into where this leads, I was walking down the steps from my ski condo in the morning and I slipped and fell down the stairs and got up and I was like, you know, a little shaken up as you would be. And okay, but I felt fine. So I went out, went out, skied for the day, came home, went to take a shower and looked at myself in the mirror. And I had this huge bruise across the back of my arm from the fall that morning and just never felt it. And I mean, it got weird enough so that I was starting to look into if I had leprosy, <laughs> one, <laughs> one of the symptoms of leprosy is that you can't feel your periphery. And, you know, so lepers lose their fingers, not because of the infection, but because of the cuts and things that they get. I can so see I've, being you that it would not be much of a stretch to go there. You would reach for the extremes because you think <laughs> I'm just an extreme human being. I have had all of these physiological issues. So, and right. well, you know, I mean, I've got an active imagination, so, but it's not, you know, it's not leprosy and it's, I have excellent blood flow in my periphery. And, you know, I mean, I go out running when it's nine degrees above zero Fahrenheit in slippers, basically, and I'm, my feet are fine and stay warm and, you know, I can feel everything. So I was like, why all of a sudden am I getting these injuries and I mean, mountain biking in Connecticut, it's a rough sport. When I started it, I broke three bones in the first 12 months and I would regularly come home covered in blood. So I had ample opportunity to notice that, gee, all of a sudden this stuff doesn't hurt me anymore. I mean, it hurts, but it hurts like a reasonable amount. And you link and it then, back to your decision to never ingest seed oils. Yeah, well, that was, so it turns out there's a literature on this that these metabolic products of seed oils break down into things that can induce pain. And there's actually a fellow by the name of Christopher Ramston who did a study on reducing seed oil intake as a treatment for chronic headaches in humans. So the problem with seed oils is ultimately that they break down into some highly toxic substances, both when you're cooking them and in the body. So part of the reason that your dietitians in the UK are pushing rapeseed is because the seed oil industry has done a lot of research into the negative effects of these products. One of my favorite papers was in an industry journal where they looked at the toxic load that develops in French fried potatoes from the seed oils going rancid as you're cooking them. They comment that this could be a public health problem as we are recommending everybody in the world eat these things and yet we've got all this literature that shows us how harmful these things are. I discovered you, Mr. Seed Oils is what I now call you. I oh, dear. <laughs> I hope you can accept that tag. Well, you That's, were for such a long I'm time. I I'm going to have to live with it, right? I've Mr. earned it. Mr. Whole Wheat, we got in touch via Twitter because I ended up reposting something from the Toronto nephrologist, Dr. Jason Fung. Worldwide, women are twice as likely to develop lung cancer as men who never smoked tobacco. And you thankfully provided me the answer for this. And, and so the answer is what? It's, it's yeah, the fumes. so it's cooking oil. And they first discovered this in China, where they discovered that there was this population of women who was really prone to getting lung cancer, but they never smoked. There's a bit of a confounder in there in that, you know, this may also be happening in men, but in China, at least men are much more likely than women to smoke. So it kind of masks the effect but they couldn't understand why all these women were getting a disease that's typically seen in smokers. And at this point, it's pretty clearly recognized that this is what's happening and the mechanisms pretty clearly understood. There's a chemical called acrolein. Read the Wikipedia article on it. It's quite entertaining. It's known as a biocide. It's so toxic. It kills any living thing. And that's one of the things in tobacco smoke that's thought to give you lung cancer. Well, it turns out that if you cook seed oils, that also turns into acrolein. So you're ingesting toxins that are similar to what are in cigarette smoke when you're leaning over the cooking the wok, I guess, in China with 
cooking with seed oils. Um, so if we go down to the local chippy and we're getting some battered cod and some fries on the side, that oil would be, what would that be? Corn oil they would use? Can, what do they use in these fast food joints? Typically it's corn oil or soybean oil. Since they ruled out trans fats, they are trying to come up with other, you know, again, because the industry recognizes the problems here that they have. And the fellow, the gentleman who discovered the dangers of trans fats, uh, Fred Kumaro, he also recognized the problems with seed oils. And he wrote when he was a hundred years old, he wrote an article called My Diet, describing how he ate because he was this renowned diet scientist. And he's quite explicit that he won't eat seed oils. But for whatever reason, trans fats have really gotten some traction and seed oils just hasn't gotten the same level of attention. But this There's is exactly another public health messaging fail. It just seems to me like, again, this is the corporate capture of our food supply. If willy nilly, these are so toxic that fully half of the women who get lung cancer never smoked, and it's because they're ingesting these carcinogenic fumes from the vats of fat frying whatever, we need to stop this clearly. Let me, let me talk about that notion of corporate capture, because this, this problem really started back in the 1800s with cottonseed oil. Cottonseed oil in its raw form is toxic, but they figured out what the toxin was and they figured out how to detoxify it. And they started adding it to lard because it was cheaper than lard. Lard was the main cooking fat back then, right? So industry thought they were doing something good. They were taking what was literally an industrial waste product, cottonseed oil, and turning it into something that you could feed humans. And while cottonseed oil in its natural form is quite toxic, you know, cottonseed oil after they detoxified it, they thought, seemed to be pretty fine. There's no evidence that seed oils are acutely toxic in the sense that like cyanide is. Yeah. Right? So wasn't but, there enough beef tallow to go around? I mean, what was the issue there that they had to cut it with this cottonseed stuff after they stripped the toxins out? Yeah, they, it was beef tallow, lard. I mean, this was enough of an issue so that they passed several laws in the United States about disclosing what lard was cut with. I found a study from Canada, from the Canadian Parliament, looking at purity of American lard, and they found that like every single American lard except for two were cut with something adulterated, in other words. Um, so it does wait. Anything. It's just, it fogs my brain. You know, we yeah, think that if annoying, it's going but... to be allowed to be sold, we would be okay putting a little bit of faith in its maker. But it just seems yeah. we're in this obesogenic hell. Yeah, so, it's just you know, toxic for all of us. But on the, on the other end of that, nowadays, the people who are, have recognized the negative effects of seed oils is industry. And they are very busily, for strange reasons, they are very busy reformulating their products Rapeseed, for instance, was another somewhat toxic fat that they detoxified through breeding to, but it also has a lot less of these. I mean, the problem with, with a seed oil is what are called the omega-6 fats. We've all heard of omega-3 fats, which are the beneficial fats in fish and why you should eat. Fish oil is an omega-3 fat. Well, omega-6 fats are mostly plant fats. Rapeseed oil, for instance, and olive oil, which are both proposed as healthy alternatives are basically healthy because they have less omega-6 fats than some of the other fats. And some of the problems that they have that industry has is in these kitchens, which are cooking with a lot of seed oils, you know, it gets into the clothes that they're wearing and into their dish rags and everything. They had a problem where they were sending their laundry out to the laundromat and the trucks would burst into flames. Oh, so it's the oxidation. It's the oxidation. The fats are so unstable that they will actually burst into flames in heat. And, you know, anybody who works with furniture, this is a problem with linseed oil, right? If you leave a linseed oil rag in the sun, it can burst into flame. So the oil industry has started reformulating their products to resolve this oxidation problem, which means that the foods you're making go rancid. Rancidity in a fat means it's gone toxic and to deal with this problem of, you know, the laundry bursting into flames, <laughs> which and, sounds and crazy, but you can, actually, yeah. you can actually find patents to address this problem. It's such an issue. Um, 
So, so the, the, the makers of all of this stuff, the industry is trying to get its house in order, but it hasn't yes. really filtered through to Joe going down to the chippy. How many times has well, that oil been reheated? Yes, it hasn't really filtered out because they, just like with the cigarette companies, they may have known that their product was dangerous, but they weren't going to come out and say it, right? So Unilever, which used to be one of the main producers of seed oils, certainly in Europe, probably in the world, at the same time, they're paying scientists and doctors in the United States to promote these products as healthy. They're desperately trying to sell them. They're businesses, right? And they have done so. They have divested themselves from the seed oil business. I mean, it's quite odd because the chairman of Unilever comes out and says that he thinks a vegetarian diet is his company's future, and yet he's just divested himself of the main vegetable fat business in the world. Because they know it's problematic. Well, all you have to do is go read the literature yeah. from their own industry. But they keep, they keep bottling it up. And, and they keep it. bottling it up and your doctor keeps telling you to take it. And so we get into diseases that are known to be caused by this in the medical literature. In our pre-podcast discussion, you mentioned macular degeneration. Yeah. Age-related macular degeneration is the primary cause of blindness in the industrial world. It's recognized in the medical industry to be basically caused by seed oil consumption at this point. And they figured this out when they started looking at adding fish oils to the diet to help the condition. And they discovered that fish oils didn't do anything for the condition. But the people who were protected were the people who weren't eating much in the way of seed oils. What they've realized is that these seed oils are breaking down into these toxins like HNE, which are only produced from these fats. And that's what's causing the eye damage. It's the same process that's going on in atherosclerosis and in Alzheimer's disease and in diabetes. It's this common thread of fats breaking down into toxins. The word for this in the medical literature is oxidative stress. And, you know, there's over 200,000 papers in the scientific and medical literature about this process. The next time you go and see your cardiologist, he'll probably tell you to worry about your LDL. Well, that's another interesting story. So back in the 1980s, there were two doctor scientists, Brown and Goldstein, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering the LDL receptor, which was supposedly how LDL causes heart disease. And the next thing that they did is they wanted to show how the first step of atherosclerosis, which is when the, your white blood cells, macrophages, turn into what they call a foam cell, how LDL induced that to happen. So they took some LDL and they incubated it with some macrophages in a laboratory somewhere, and it didn't work. Oops. Yeah. So two other scientists, doctors, Whitstam and Steinberg, figured out a few years later why it didn't work. What they discovered was that the LDL, the fats in the LDL had to be oxidized. And once they were oxidized, then the white blood cells would take it up and take the LDL up, only the oxidized LDL, and become foam cells. So then they started trying to figure out how to make this happen, right? How do we turn an LDL into one of these LDLs that can be oxidized? And they discovered it was by feeding seed oils. And they did it first in rabbits, and then they did it in humans. But this distinction isn't made at all when we talk about LDL. All we know is it's the bad cholesterol, if you still buy into that cholesterol con that the dear Ansel Keys gave us all. And I know he well, has a role, a role in this whole piece as well, He does have a role in, in this whole thing. So, I mean, one of those doctors, uh, Steinberg, was the fellow who convinced Merck to introduce the first statin drug. And he thought that this would basically solve the problem that he had identified, right? If you have less LDL, there's less of it to get oxidized, and that would probably be better for you. And he dropped the whole causation that he had discovered. Ansel Keys comes into this very interestingly. The same scientist who did that study I mentioned before about seed oils causing chronic headaches started going back and looking at some of the classic studies that were used to 
convince doctors that these seed oils had benefit in cardiovascular disease. You've probably heard this story, but please bear with me. And one of the studies that he looked at was called the Minnesota Coronary Experiment. Now, oh, yes. <laughs> and, yes, you're laughing. This is a classic. Um, yeah. Ansel Keys had done this epidemiological study called the Seven Countries Study that was basically a failure. He was trying to show that saturated fat caused heart disease, and he was really unable to do so, mainly because there was a big confounder in the Japanese who didn't have a relationship between LDL and heart disease the way everybody else did. So it wasn't clearly causal, right? But he still liked the idea. And to deal with the criticism that epidemiology is a pretty poor form of research, he organized this Minnesota coronary experiment, which he ran with a fellow by the name of France. I can't remember his name, but you know, it was Ansel Keys's study. And he was trying to show that if you reduced saturated fat and increased seed oils, it would lower LDL, and this would be good for your heart disease risk. So this scientist, Ramsden, went and talked to the son of France and found out that his dad had left a box of results from the study that they'd never published, okay? Now, he'd already just been through this with the Sydney Diet Heart Study, where he found these computer tapes, and it turned out that in both of these studies, what it looked like was happening was that the seed oils were indeed lowering cholesterol. That's pretty conclusive what they do. But all the people who were taking more seed oils, the intervention wing, were dying at a higher rate. And they were dying at a higher rate from heart disease. But we didn't know that because they didn't publish the results. So these were two of the key studies that had been used to promote the heart healthy aspect of seed oils. You know, I've asked this question on Twitter and I've looked in the literature. Is there another explanation for why we get heart disease other than this pathway that starts with seed oils and leads to oxidated N6 fats and consequent damage? And there isn't. This is the predominant hypothesis in cardiovascular disease for why this is happening but they don't say it. They just say, take your statin, then you'll have less LDL. Now, there are other guys who are still doing research. Whitstam kept doing the research up until the current age. I don't think he's retired yet. And there's huge relationships between cardiovascular disease risk and these oxidized seed oils, what's called oxidized LDL. It's the primary candidate for what's causing this stuff. You know, and this is not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this no. is the medical literature that's saying this. And, and I mean, you, you know, spend so much time digging into all of this. I want to skip through some of the things that I think my listeners will find very useful because there's so much deep history and I know that you know it and you can recite all kinds of interesting facts. But what I want to know is when I went into a local pharmacy chain yesterday, I saw capsules marketed as the perfect balance of problematic omega-6s, three sixes and nines. So what's that all about? Because I, I turned it over and I looked and I thought, okay, so star flower oil is the first ingredient and then smaller quantities of fish oil, which those of us who I know that, you know, you know, you've listened to some of my earlier podcasts. I've had inflammation issues since menopause, Hashimoto's, mm -hmm. um, a bit of autoimmunity and something that for two years was diagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis, but I have beaten that back with with food, you know, given up gluten and never really had sugar and all of that. So this little jar of stuff, it was mostly these seed oils. And it's, it's quite popular at the local pharmacies. It's roughly equivalent to giving a drowning man a glass of water. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty well recognized that we eat way too much omega-6 fats. Um, nobody needs more supplementation with omega-6 fats. You know, the scientists have done studies where they reduced the amount of omega-6 fats, and it turns out it makes your omega-3 fats in the diet improve. So just as with age-related macular degeneration, there's a benefit to cutting your omega-6 fats in terms of your body will be better able to access the omega-3 fats. And I won't bore you with the whole story about omega-3 versus omega-6 fats, but they do tend to be at odds in your body. So if you were eating too much seed oils, you 
will not have as much of the more beneficial omega-3 fats that people go to all this trouble to consume fish oils. Bill I still has... pop two a day because I've got Hashimoto's to fight inflammation. Should I not be doing that? I can you do you eat fish? Yes. Yeah, much. I wouldn't do it. Fish I wouldn't and plants, do it if and you're that's all fish. I eat. And if you really. if you've cut seed oils out, I personally I got into this even before way, way, way back at the beginning of fish oil was the first supplement I started taking because they did a fascinating study in a British prison where they gave people fish oil and it reduced their aggressive behavior and they thought it had all these benefits for the brain. And so I was like, okay, so I started popping fish oil and, you know, I never noticed any difference from it. But when I cut back on omega-6, on the other hand, that made a huge difference. And I think cod liver oil did a lot of benefit to my bones when I first fixed my body. There's a fascinating paper about an orphanage in the 1920s in Canada where they had a bunch of malnourished kids and they let the kids eat whatever they wanted to, to see if they could cure their malnourishment without any guidance from the adults. And for instance, and they all did amazingly. And there was one kid who had rickets and cod liver oil is a rich source of uh, vitamin D, of course, and also the other fats that you need to cure rickets. And this kid ate cod liver oil until his rickets were cured. And then he never touched it again, which was fascinating because that was exactly my experience. I started taking cod liver oil and for like eight months, I couldn't go to sleep at night until I had my cod liver oil. And then one day I just had no interest in it. And I've never taken it since, but I've also never broken a bone since. So, Wow. Yeah, you're that so rubber I think, ball, rubber ball down the slopes and on your bike. So it's it's the healing power of that, but I guess it maxes out at a certain point and you don't get any additional benefit. Well, both of these fats, I mean, to get to the more high level point of view, polyunsaturated fats are in all real foods, right? We need them to some extent in our diet, but we don't need the amounts that we're currently getting, right? So if you're eating... A whole now this isn't let's not I mean I was probably deficient when I fixed my diet and if you have rickets you're deficient obviously but once you cure that deficiency I don't think there's really any reason to supplement with omega-6 fats or omega-3 fats because you're getting you know if you're eating a real food diet you're getting what you should be getting I mean there's you can't become deficient in polyunsaturated fatty acids unless you're eating it, what I like to call the modern American diet, MAD, or if you're in a lab, or if you're under the care of a physician. Nobody gets polyunsaturated fatty acid deficiency, except in those three circumstances. And now so we get the PUFAs, as they're called, in 60% of the American diet, 50% of the UK diet, all of these horrible, highly processed PUFAs, which are not good at all. Right. And right. that's, that's sort of a whole other subject. You have made a fascinating link with sunburn. You don't get sunburned anymore since you started saying no to seed oils in your diet. Tell us about this. And I mean, is this settled science at all? Is this written up elsewhere? Okay, so let's go through that little, that little story. Um, as I mentioned, I ski. And if to your viewers, they will see that I am blonde and blue eyed and the sort of fellow who would certainly be susceptible, one would think, to a sunburn. And for most of my adult life, I would burn in about 45 minutes out in the sun. I hated going to the beach. It really hurt my eyes, uh, the sunlight. And, you know, so I tried not to go outside. But I also hate sunscreen. So when I did go outside, I wouldn't use sunscreen. What that says about my IQ, you can infer <laughs> yourself. But anyway, maybe I'm just really stubborn. So, Willful um, male <laughs> deciding yeah. that it's not going to hurt him. Okay. So, Seen it before. Um, I think I fixed my diet in early March. And then later on in March, I went out and skied all day on a you know sunny bluebird day, not a cloud in the sky. And I fully expected to get a burn. And, you know, I got up the next morning and I looked in the mirror and I was like, wow, I didn't get a burn. Huh. Oh, well, you know, mentioned it to my wife at the time. And that was kind of interesting. Was Her, she out with you? And did she get burned? She hadn't been out. She wasn't as much of an avid skier as I was. And she was also Colombian and dark skinned. So she's not as subject to sunburn as I was. So one of the accounts I'd read, and you know, let me just say a lot of this diet stuff, there can often be a fine line between craziness and science. 
And there are lots of people I respect for their dietary views who espouse things like, you know, Chinese medicine, not to pick on anything in particular that I don't think has a scientific basis. So I'm always conscious that when you hear an anecdote from somebody that, okay, they, maybe they feel this way, but who knows if, right? You got to be really careful about the cause and effect on these things. A couple of weeks later, my now ex-wife and I went into New York City to a barefoot running event, as a matter of fact, with barefoot Ted McDonald, who was one of the leaders of that whole movement. And we sat out in the sun in Central Park. The leaves hadn't come out on the trees yet. So we sat out in the sun for two and a half hours. You know, we left at the end of the thing and went home. And my wife said, look at the burn that I got. I looked at myself and I said, I didn't burn at all. Now, so there we are, dark-skinned Colombian and me, pale face. <laughs> sun magnet, sunburn magnet. Yeah. So yeah, what's sunburn at work magnet. there? What's at work there then? stood side by side, clear experiment in the same sun for two and a half hours and she burned and I didn't. That was really interesting. Well, then I started looking into this. I went back to the literature and in the literature, it's quite clear that the amount of, they use a nude mouse model for sunburn and skin cancer. And in the literature, it's quite clear that how fast they get skin cancer is determined by how much polyunsaturated fat is in their diet. And beyond that, that you can't give them skin cancer if they don't get at least some polyunsaturated fat in the diet, which is one of three models that I'm aware of cancers that you cannot induce experimentally without omega-6 fats in the diet. Wow. Um, and, you know, if you go and you look at what is happening to people's skin when they get sunburn, the UV light is breaking down these N6 fats into toxins. This is the same thing that's happening in age-related macular degeneration. The blue light, blue light is sufficient to break these things down. It's so susceptible to oxidation and to oxidative damage that even blue light is enough to cause these to break down and start oxidizing. That's why they sell olive oil in dark bottles and why you should buy any sort of cooking oil in a dark bottle. And because glass it will is oxidize just right? sitting on the shelf. And a glass bottle too? Yeah, a glass, glass bottle ideally, plastic. but it has to be something that doesn't let light through. There's an extensive literature around this. Homer Black was a guy who did a lot of research on this, who unfortunately also had a saturated fat phobia. But, you know, this is one of the things where the anecdotal evidence has just taken off. I mean, I've got a whole huge list of people on Twitter saying, I don't understand. I went carnivore and now I don't get burned anymore. And what happened? You know, well, anecdotal, you know, as we know in low carb, high fat, low carb, medium fat community, the clinical evidence and the anecdotal is starting to carry a lot of weight. I want to get some quick answers, some short hits on if there is a problem with these seed oils, transdermal, you know, what about skincare products? Are those okay? Or does your skin protect them from any sort of problematic breakdown? I've looked into that. I haven't seen anything. What I do suggest to people is that you want to eat your skincare. You don't want to slather it on your skin. I know several people who've had hand cracks. My fiance, for instance, who's a nurse, had cracked heels and cracked hands that she attributed to her using all the nasty chemicals that they use at the hospital to clean your hands. She was a Grieger vegan when uh, so it's lack of Grieger. B12. Is it now, lack well, of B12 then? I think it's a lot of the animal fats because she, her cracked heels healed up and her hands now are as soft as can be. And she's still using all the nasty chemicals and has her skincare routine. And she started to eat animal products. Yeah, she gave up veganism. I, she wasn't 100% vegan, but pretty much. We got back together for a social dinner almost about a year and a half ago. She had a weight problem. She's the same age that I am. We went to high school together. She's looking at me and she's like, why do you look so young? I don't like to evangelize about this stuff, believe it or not. I mean, not in a social setting. But every time I go out to dinner, I have to have a negotiation with the restaurant staff about what I can eat. <laughs> so it comes up. And yeah. there she is, this near vegan, and I'm sitting there eating a bunch of sausages and no vegetables. <laughs> yeah. and she's like, what are you doing? And so I told her, I told her a sentence of what to do, what I do and what she should do differently. And it was, you know, avoid seed oils, avoid refined carbohydrates, eat lots of animal protein and animal fats. 
That was it's it. such a and tough I... corner to turn. We talked quite a lot before we started mm -hmm. recording, and you know from listening to my earlier podcast, my whole cascade of, of problems came after probably a decade of being hardcore vegetarian. Right. I gave her a really short explanation because I figured as a vegan, she wouldn't really want to be, I didn't want to get into a debate over it, right? I've done way too many of those. And this was an old friend. I didn't want to evangelize, but she asked a question. So two weeks later, she calls me up and she said, okay, so I did what you said for me to do. And I've lost 17 pounds so far. And how, how long was that? And what sort of a time frame? Two weeks. She's, she's lucky. I mean, you and I both know some people respond better than others. She's one of the super responders. She lost... 56 pounds in two and a half months and got back to her high school weight. Holy um, doodle. That is huge because I've been five years keto. And <laughs> I mean, I think I'm bigger than I've ever been, but that's another thing. I mean, when you've got thyroid issues, dysfunction, right. that's incredible. And she had fibromyalgia that she had had for decades. And that is completely in remission. And now she goes and runs with me and skis with me. You know, the pain, the muscle and joint pain that she used to have continuously is completely gone. So Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, what are the healthy non-carcinogenic fats? What's what's the list? What do you cook with now? Uh, butter, coconut oil, if, you know, depending on the flavor in the dish, mostly butter. Ghee is good. Some people do better than ghee if they can't tolerate the proteins in butter. I will occasionally use olive oil. I try and get a California olive oil. There's a huge problem with adulteration in the olive oil industry, which is the topic of a whole other podcast. But odds are eight out of 10 if you get by olive oil, it's adulterated with seed oils. And what's a seed oil? Anything from a seed and utter a bean. So, you know, soybean oil, corn oil, pretty much all of those you want to avoid. As I mentioned, industry has been trying to make these healthier. So there are high oleic versions of some of these, like sunflower oil or rapeseed oil. They're working on higher oleic versions. For some people, that's their option because you know, I mean, there are Indians I've talked to who are vegetarian for religious reasons, and they have, they want to be able to use some sort of vegetable fat. You want a high oleic one if you're going to use it, if you're going to cook with it. And you've got a and, blog, you've got articles that you've written um, digging into all of this. So people can go to your blog, which I will put in the show notes. What are your unbreakable rules after all of those years? I mean, you pretty much 20 through mid 40s had a life of deep systemic distress. And now you're loving your life. What are your unbreakable rules to optimize your health? Yeah, well, let me just say one, one thing about when uh, my now fiance and I got back together, she asked me what drugs I was on. And <laughs> I was like, I don't take any drugs. She goes, well, why not? What, what, what do you do when you get injured? And I said, well, it doesn't really hurt all that much. I don't worry about it. It just heals up. I don't, you know, she was blown away. She's a nurse. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You know, the notion of somebody who never even needed to go see a doctor, and I was really sick at one point, really blew her mind. Um, my unbreakable rules are I am super gluten intolerant. I mean, so that's an absolute must. I never, ever, ever touch anything with gluten in it knowingly. That's kind of specific to me. Seed oils, I, I don't have any of them except for that one you know, I have a bottle of olive oil in the house, which I will go through over about the course of a year. So I don't use any of that. I do most of my own cooking. Restaurants, I'm very careful about not seed oil contamination. And that's really hard because they all use seed oils. You know, if you get a salad dressing in a restaurant, it's made from seed oils. It's not made from olive oil, no matter what they tell you. Um, really? Yeah. Um... And then, you know, junk food. Um, I mean, pretty much the definition of junk food is refined sugars, refined carbohydrates, and refined fats. And those are just things that, you know, I really don't eat. I mean, I'll have a healthy, the 85% chocolate bars or stuff like that once in a while as a treat. And, you know, once in a while I'll have some ice cream and even with a little sugar in the ice cream, if you don't have too much of it, I'm not worried about it, but. Well, you've healed your body now, so you can, you know, give it a little, little bit of something and not yes, have and my, the whole system go wackadoodle again. My tolerance has definitely gone way up for from what it initially was, where I couldn't tolerate going off at all. Um, that's definitely been a change that I've noticed. I make sure that I get regular exercise. I think that's really important. When I run, I tend to go out in the morning and I may go for three or four hours. 
and I don't eat beforehand, I don't bring any water along, you know, I think that helps your body to adapt and become more resilient. Um, do you do I don't long even get fasts? hungry on runs now, basically. No. But I completely agree. When you control your hunger, the tyranny of food, you lose it. You are in control. So you're not grabbing at snacks all the time. That was one thing that I did a lot of when I started fixing my diet, which is snacking. And I would just go buy healthy snacks, uh, macadamia nuts, which are low in omega-6 and high in omega-3, and you know, dark chocolate, 85% chocolate. After a while, you just kind of get out of the habit of snacking and you don't yeah. miss it. And you know, I mean, it's great. You know, when I go backpacking, I'll bring beef sticks and dark chocolate along and I usually never even eat them. Um, yeah. But they're there as your go-tos in case you do feel yeah, like an, you... it's there and it makes it certainly makes you feel better if you know you, you go on a three-day camping trip you want to bring three-day backpacking trip you want to bring some snacks along just for your psychological well-being if, no, even if you never eat them absolutely and i used to be one of these people who got hangry i mean i would shake if i missed a meal that just doesn't happen anymore and yeah. i certainly don't miss it yeah, well, you, you were carb addicted, obviously, then, because that just sets you up, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. You had a load of problems, and you managed to find a path, but it was only because you had the skills to do the digging and more digging. that No one knew what was happening with you. Well, I was terrified because, I mean, they had to take out part of my intestines, and I didn't get better. So I was like, I've, these are supposed to be around for the next 40 odd years. I'm going to run out of intestines here if they have to keep taking things out. This is not good. No, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, scary. you have longevity in your family. So anyway, okay, I'm going to wind myself up, Tucker Goodrich. Huge thanks for sharing your fascinating, incredible story, your personal story, and your Thank deep you. insights That's into the role of seed oils in the, the plague of civilization diseases that has us in its grip right alongside COVID. But thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. And now you can listen to The Big Middle and click into the show notes at susanflory.com. And thank you so much for your generous donations to support this podcast, because as you know, I do the research. I do the tedious sometimes editing all on my lonesome. So I do need to defray some of the costs. And I, I really appreciate you clicking onto that button. It helps a lot. And if you do have anyone you want on the show, drop me a line. There's a form on the contact page or say hello on Twitter. And well, final thing, stay well. Ciao for now. Bye-bye, Tucker. Bye, Susan. Thank you so much again.